It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Black Eagle Arrows, Fourth Arrow Camera Arms, Wind Scent Vapor Hunting Scents, Killer Food Plot Seeds, Supplements, and Attractants, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Tradition Tree Stands, and Badass Slingshots. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal Podcast, everybody. I'm host Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin today with Dan DeFall. Yes, I said today it is Saturday instead of Sunday. Yeah, it's a little day early. Day early, and... Uh, uh, speaking of early, it, it, it is early, 10 o'clock. Yeah, it is 10 o'clock, a.m. A.m. Had two cups of coffee, ready to rock. Uh, uh, yeah. Heading north, so we thought we'd uh, get this show done early for you folks, so they're live stream. Uh, actually, we're going to do a little different dynamic, so you guys have to check that out as well. Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit different, trying, you know... We're never the same. No, no. We'll always try to shake it up a little bit, but uh, we got to get in the woods, so to be able to do that, we're bringing you the show today. That's right. But uh, today's show is going to be a little different. Uh, Dan, you remember last week I, I went and got to see a guest speaker. Yeah, you, you decided to travel across the state and go see a guest speaker. Went and Not seen just any guest speaker. Shane Mahoney, conservationist. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and if you're not familiar with his work or who he is... Um, He's the modern day Teddy Roosevelt, I guess. Is right, what they equate exactly. him to. So, the modern day, uh, yeah, exactly. And, uh, interesting guy. Well, you, we're letting Danny listen to segments as we go along here. We're going to have the, actually Shane uh, his speech that I listened to on the show, and we're going to break it up into segments and and talk about it a little bit before and after. But uh, just be patient with us because this was recorded in a lecture hall. It was recorded on my iPhone, and uh, I've, I've worked on the audio a little bit and got it to where it's it's you can actually listen and understand. But uh, so just be patient with it. It's uh, yeah, you, you're gonna have to listen to it and uh, get your ears on. Uh, if you got headphones, put those on, listen to it. But it's really good. So uh, without further ado, here was uh, this last Tuesday at uh, Michigan State University in lecture hall with Shane Mahoney. I personally do not believe, nor have I ever believed, as far as I can remember, that there was any more important endeavor in human existence than this effort we call conservation. I do believe that it is not only one of the greatest ideas that we have ever promulgated, but I think it is probably the one that, as time proceeds through this 21st century, and long before we get to the middle or the end of it, Perhaps many, many other people in both industrialized and non-industrialized nations of the world will come to agree and understand that what we do around and about and with this wonderful notion will determine the stability, the comfort, the quality of human life going forward, and it will also determine the richness of the wild others that share this planet with us. I think it is very important that I give you some understanding of my personal philosophy, which has matured over time. I haven't been a complete mushroom. I do learn a little bit as I grow in age. Um, but it has never really fundamentally changed. And the most important thing you need to understand about what I'm going to say going forward is that I don't really see much difference between us and them. I am a person who has participated in the harvest of wild creatures because I come from Newfoundland and the culture there is a fishing and hunting culture. And I have done it outside of those circumstances. But I am not afforded the luxury of saying that they are so different from us, the moose I hunt, or the bear I hunt, or the birds I hunt, or the animals I catch, the fish I eat. I am not afforded the luxury that some have of believing they are somehow miraculously different from us, and therefore the experience is somehow different for them. I cannot be afforded that. I will not abide by that idea. I think it is manifestly ridiculous. And so I take my association with conservation and with the rest of the natural world extremely personal. This is to the disconcert of some and the 
the uncomfortability of some, but I can assure you I'm not alone in these students, and I believe the more we are able to understand what we share with the rest of animal creation, the more likely we are to do good things for it. I am also, however, a deep believer in the necessity of ensuring the quality of life for human beings. I am not, despite my love for them, anti-human. On the contrary, I grew up in a culture where the great attributes of humanness, generosity, kindness, humility, sharing, cooperation, were extended and manifest every day of my childhood and every day of my life back there. I was born on the island of Newfoundland. I was raised on the island of Newfoundland, and I will die on that island beyond any question. So just as I don't see any separation very much between them and us, I also, in a very strange way, also don't see any separation between us and them, or them and us, or me and all of that, humanity and a lot of others for the planet. That is my personal philosophy, deeply embedded. It might as well be trapped in amber because it is immutable and it will not be changed by any arguments that I have ever encountered. And just to safeguard it, I'm not going to read any more of my life or listen to arguments because it might change how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> my earliest experiences also don't explain what I'm going to say today. My earliest experience that I can remember, and I am told I was three, was capturing bumblebees in jars of thistle bushes in the backyard of a place, a house, a place called St. Anthony, the very tip of the northern peninsula of Newfoundland. There were no roads, and we were still traveled by dog team at the time. And I have only then a cascading series of memories of being with creatures all of my life. And like uh, a musician or an athlete, I got to stay a boy for a very long period of time because I got a job when I grew up, and that job put me out in wilderness for almost 25 years on extended periods of time every year where I lived, lived with wildness. And all of that only reinforced more in me the capacities they have, the beauty they represent, the inspiration they convey, and the sheer desperate loneliness that would result if we were ever to lose them. Now, at the same time, our relationships with them in modern time have become subjects of great debate. Should we engage in one way or another? What should our roles in conservation be? What should our models be? So let me talk about another experience from Newfoundland, and this time that involves both fascinating animal species and the fascinating aspect of Newfoundland culture. As most of you probably know, one of the most controversial engagements with wild nature in the world that we know of is the Newfoundland seal hunt. This was a practice that was carried out for 350 years out of necessity, because nobody would do it otherwise out of necessity on the east and northeast coast of the island of Newfoundland, where men would go out in ships, jump over the side, and all day long would walk across floating carpets of pack ice that were constantly floating underneath them, where one false step as you moved across these floating pans meant you went down to an abyss of salt, cold water that killed you pretty much instantly. And you hunted seals on that ice, and you skinned them, and you eviscerated them, and you brought back the meat, and you brought back the pellets, and you hoped that you survived the three, four, or five week journey that that represented. You lived in a circumstance of filth and cold and danger at a level that no one, really, who hasn't done it can appreciate. And it makes me marvel at the heroes, who so-called, who pretend that any kind of modern hunting excursion is such an incredible challenge. Well, I would like them to look at the black and white photographs from the 1930s and so on to see what a dangerous hunt really looks like. The end result, of course, of the controversies over seal hunting meant that eventually 
the seal hunted Newfoundland became essentially something virtually lost. And at the same time, not long before, we experienced the collapse of the northern cod fishery. And so what happened in the homes, in the individual family dwellings, in the individual communities of that one culture, was that the men who were the ones who went to sea were suddenly at home with the ones who stayed at home to look after the home, the women in most cases in that culture. And they suddenly were completely out of their lives. And what they would do is they would get up early in the morning, the men, and they would go out to the wards or walk around the communities so that when the school bus came for their children, their children would not see them sitting at the kitchen table, a sight they could never remember because their fathers were always gone before the light of day. And then the men would come home and they would stay there until such time as the school bus would come again at 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. And then they would find something else to do at that time so that it wasn't so manifestly clear that their lives had been undone. Undone, in the case of cod, by an excessive slaughter of the fish species. Undone, in the case of the seal hunt, by the protestations of people who had a very different worldview and managed to essentially stop that hunt, despite the fact that 7.2 million harp seals swim our waters. Well, I told you it'd be a little bit different trying to uh, listen to that in a lecture hall type setting. <laughs> well, you and uh, I don't know how big the lecture hall was, but uh, it was probably a 250 person lecture hall. Was it? Yeah. Okay. And there was probably 150 people there, 100, 150. Yeah, see, people wanted to hear him talk. Yeah. So and talk he started. What do, you, what do you think? Okay, so, you know, it's an interesting story, you know, about his background and, and how he said he's going to live, grow up, and die there, basically. Right. Yeah, it's pretty uh, profound. <laughs> right. Um, interesting uh, take towards the end there when he was talking about uh, <clears throat> the, the cod industry and the seals and how they lived through it. And it was devastating when the cod got overfished. Mm-hmm. And, and the whole industry collapsed. Collapsed. But then that was something uh, brought upon themselves. Mm-hmm. And the other part was society dictating something about the seals when, uh, the, however, it got hold of that they would go do this. Even though, as he said, it was four to five weeks that they were hoping that they would live. Right, right. This just wasn't a. a, a and that's kind of the. If four you, to five week seal hunt. Right. And, and basically, one wrong move, you're dead. Yep. Then that's you never hear about that. No, you just hear about how they go out on the ice club ski at seals and everything. Yep, and society, even though there's the cod industry wiped itself out, but the seal industry was still is still seven million strong. Mm-hmm. But because it's looked upon as a society bad thing, mm-hmm. it got canceled. Yep, yep. I don't know if it got totally canceled or whatnot, but well, I know it, we're in Alaska. Um, you know, a uh, guy that we used to run with here, uh, that our general Chip Hailstone, yep. who's now on Life Below Zero, him and his family on, on uh, I believe it's on Nat Geo. Yep. If you watch that, they still harvest seals over there. They they have a, a, a me, very strict. Let me take it. They still kill seals. <laughs> that word is ingrained in my head from from, from society. Don't want to go pick a seal. No. But no, but they, but very strictly though that right. they maintain it. I, I think she's allowed one. Yeah, they go out and she gets her one. Uh, matter of fact, this episode was just on this past week. It was. I watched it. And <laughs> it, it, strangely it, enough, right? And you know, and she takes everything, everything. from that animal. Mm-hmm. Now go go here to Newfoundland when they're going out clubbing seals. You know, but because society said that's bad, they're really cute. You can't do that anymore. Right. But it was devastating to the their community well-being of the community and then he goes on as you listen and 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 how the the parents the men made sure that the kids didn't see them sitting at the table still teaching their kids even amongst uh amongst the uh devastation of devastation their, their employment right that hey uh even though you, we're still getting up going to work you still go to work yeah You're still you don't sit home at the table you know, waiting. No, you get up, you go do something, yep. and, and you maintain, and you you keep going. Mm-hmm. You just don't fold up, and right. that's it. 
Mm-hmm. But no, really, really good start. It it makes me wonder if his dad was a seal harvester. I'm I'm gonna bet it was either cod or, or somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah, because he. He's definitely brought up in the outdoors and in the wild. You, you can hear it in his voice, his passion. You know, the thing that really struck me is, uh, you know, we would be direly alone if we didn't have animals on this planet. If something were to happen and we were to lose our animals, we would be direly alone. Right, exactly. We would be direly alone. And and, and like he said, uh, he when he explained um, the four to five week period that they went through on these seal hunts, and he kind of laughs now when he hears... Uh, the person say the hunting that they were doing was hard. Right, right, right. And, yeah, yeah. And he compares know, it to what it, these guys were doing. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. and how they traveled around the island uh, by dog sled team. Mm-hmm. Now they just didn't hop in the car. But I think his parents. Yeah, there's some effect from everything that went on that he lived through. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, we're going to throw it to a break here. We come back. We're going to listen to another segment of the speech. All right. We'll be right back after this. PSC Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organic fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much-needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential. Hey, welcome back to the second segment of the show, and now we're going to join back in with the lecture with Shane Mahoney. Some of you in this room are obviously still working your way early through the process of having a conservation agenda, a life, a career, and I set up these couple of small examples to try and impress the second great attribute of conservation, along with the fact that it is the most important idea we and that is that it is extraordinarily extraordinarily complex that involves the full range of emotions, of politics, of law, of differing value systems for people around the world, across the world, in a globalized world, and that the lives and livelihoods of people are intimately tied with the lives and livelihoods, if I may use that term, of wild nature, and that neither can really, at this point, time to really get along without the help of the other. Wildlife is no longer an accident on this planet, ladies and gentlemen. I can assure you, not in Africa, not in Asia, not on this continent, nowhere on this planet anymore is wildlife abundance or wildlife existence an accident. It will occur and they will be maintained by virtue of the decisions that human beings, at their best, in every culture and in every system will make on their behalf, for them, in their interests, while at the same time recognizing that in doing so we can help ourselves, but at the same time we must restrain ourselves. I am always amazed when people talk about conservation as though it is something easy to understand, and as though You can be an expert in this business simply because maybe you have a goldfish at home. Or because maybe you like to hunt ducks. Or maybe because you're a rock climber. Or maybe because you simply like to sit at the seaside and watch the dead jellyfish eventually float in. Well, unfortunately for the natural world and for all of us, I suppose, or maybe fortunately, Conservation is a complicated business that demands discipline, time, effort, knowledge, expertise, and unbelievable commitment. 
to really try and make a difference here. That does not mean that conservation is the domain of elites. But it does mean it's a domain of the committed. Very frequently in lectures, the issues of leadership and the issues of why conservation matter arise. They may not be so explicitly detailed as it was in the actual title for this particular talk, but they arise everywhere. They arise in the media, they arise in lectures, they arise in, in, in classes, they arise in structured programs, because they really are the, the big questions. I mean, why does conservation matter on the one hand, and what kind of leadership do we need to achieve? I'm not going to dwell on the issues of why conservation matters beyond the few opening comments that I made that it is capable of inspiring us. It is something we rely on physically and naturally, and it's something that enriches our lives, and that without a functioning natural world, we don't exist. Let us basically accept some of those arguments so we can get on to some of the other questions here. Let me only say, in the wake of that acceptance, if you agree, that we also must accept that the circumstances facing this planet, despite all the efforts of people in this room, of people like you in other rooms, at universities all over the world, in many businesses, in many homes, in many cultures, in many governments, despite the billions and billions and billions of dollars that we are spending, despite the incredible accumulation of science that we have, despite all of that, you only have to check the latest month of publications or the latest announcements from reputable conservation organizations to realize that we remain in a battle. We remain in a battle for the conservation of the natural world. It may be hard to think so when one can look at the slopes of mountains in Montana and see cloaks of elk moving slowly in the morning sun. But it is not hard to imagine when somebody tells you that the insect life of Europe has fallen by 65 to 70 percent in the last 30 to 40 years. It is not difficult to understand when you understand that in all of Africa, all of the fabled continent of Africa, only about 33,000 wild lions live. And that the pressures upon them and other iconic species in that, on that continent are extraordinary and demand everything that we can possibly devote to it to even halt it, let alone solve the problems. In the midst of all of that, it is possible for people to say, well, what can we do? What can we do with this massive, complex, difficult problem? What can I, as an individual sitting in this room, do? What can this university do? What can an organization like the Boone and Crockett Club do? What can the Nature Conservancy do? What can any of us do? Well, the, the truth is we can do a lot. And we have incredible examples all around the world, but we need not travel that far to understand that it is fully within the capacity of human beings to develop leadership and conservation that succeeds against all odds. We don't have to be driven just by passion and idealism, although I can assure you it doesn't hurt to have that fuel in your tank. Because we can also use empirical evidence to show us the achievements that can be made. Bill, in his kind introduction to me, references a period of time in the past in this country, the United States of America, when wildlife depletion was the norm and when individuals who organized displays of the mounted heads and horns and forebodies of wild creatures from the American West and other parts of your country said to the citizens of the United States of America, come and see the vanishing wildlife of America, because in all likelihood, you will not see it for very long more. And on those walls were bison and pronghorn and mule deer and elk and caribou and black bear and a host of other species. And this was all at a time 
When America was driven by ideas of individualism, as you still are, by the idea of the right of the individual to do well and to have commercial gain unhindered by government, a time when religious attitudes firmly entrenched the notion that all people had dominion over nature, when at the time that even citizenship was being viewed as the preoccupation of individuals who took land from the wild and turned it into a domesticated agricultural version that they could live easily with. It was at a time when there were very few or no game laws. It was at a time when there were no university programs teaching wildlife science. It was a time when there were no state agencies. It was at a time where there were no funding mechanisms. It was a time where there were no academic journals dealing with these issues. And yet a handful of people, a handful of people, not just people in the Buddha Crockett Club or they were prominent, but a handful of them and others, set about to change the course of the history of this country in the matter of conservation. And somehow, somehow, they managed to build a system of conservation in your country that eventually became a model for the world. That included, yes, the sustainable use of wildlife, but also included the preservation of special places and special systems. That included a broad view of what wildlife was, not just species that could be hunted, but species that would never be hunted. I came to recognize that the great wild beauty of America was the actual system of art galleries and museums that did not exist inside buildings for you, as it did in Europe, but was actually played out in a wild, natural existence and landscapes. All right. That's about halfway through, Danny. What do you think? Well, I tell you what, an interesting comment that I picked up on was when he talked about having the mounted heads in New York City mm -hmm. and the tagline was, come see the vanishing wildlife. animals, yeah. wildlife. Yeah. That was talked about, actually, I didn't re record that part of, uh, it was an introduction into him by... Somebody from MSU who introduced him. And, okay. And, and they were talking about Boone and Crockett and how that kind of all formed uh, in the 1870s with Roosevelt and four others in the formation of Yellowstone. But then this, I believe that was 1897 or 98, um, or maybe early 1900s. I can't remember the date exactly. But anyway, that that was what was going on. You right. Know, the, 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 the commercialization the... Of, of wild food and selling it, and it was depleting it in... They took taxidermy mounts to New York City and said, come see the wildlife, the vanishing wildlife, because right. you're never going to see them again. The bears, the elks, the caribou, the mule deer, you know, the bison. Now, it, it, it's amazing to me that uh, Teddy Roosevelt and company sat down around the table, or whatever it was they sat mm -hmm. down, and said, we got a problem, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like... Five guys had the forethought to have what we have today. You know, there was no game laws. There was no monies to mm -hmm. be get brought in. There was no nothing. And they said, hey, we got a problem. Right. That's, <laughs> and that's usually how things work. You'll get mm -hmm. a couple of guys that will, will spark something, and they'll sit down, and, and something will propagate from that. Right. And in this case, Teddy Roosevelt and company, and this is where it went. Well, and you think about it. That was in the 1870s and 80s. They started formulating this plan and then got Yellowstone up, up and going. Uh, the first, you know, national wild, wild area, uh, sanctuary, or whatever you want to call it, a park, and to what we have today, and how long it took to get. I mean, that was in the eight, like I said, eighteen ninety, late eighteen nineties, early nineteen hundreds, when they had that that uh, display in New York City, right? And it was still going on, you know, and it, it was twenty, thirty years before they, you know, really got a hold of it and, and got what they needed to get going and started right. getting game laws implemented. I mean, but, it, it, it's a long, like. What he's, and he alludes to this later, it's the long haul. Conservation doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen uh, over a couple of years. I, I think what kind of got me a little bit was it, it does take a long time, but you got to start somewhere. Right. And, and, and it's kind of funny when he mentioned you're an expert if you have a goldfish. Right. Right. right? But it, it, or you hunt ducks. But mm -hmm. it, it's to me, you got to start somewhere. Mm hmm. You're right. It is a long haul. It's like a logging project. It's, right. I'm gonna. You're gonna have three types of benefits. You're gonna have immediate benefit. You're gonna have the midterm, and then you're gonna have the long term. Right. And, and you're they're all, all different. And they're all different. They're all aspects, but they're all different. And you got in the plan mm -hmm. that you have looks at that. 
you know, and we're talking out to 2040, I think, in my plan. Right. And here it is, the same thing. Conservation it has a short term, a mid term, and a long term. Right. And you got to start somewhere. That's you the key, I think. You got to have you got to have a vision. You got to have a dream. Um, you got to have people help help you along the way, like minded. Um, you know, and, and some of the issues you have to deal with, like he he mentioned in the beginning of the segment, was, you know, emotional, political. Uh, cultural, you know, those are all, all things that, that go into it that um, that can change in the ebb and flow of conservation, what it means. You know, I mean, what we do here in North America, what we've set up or what Teddy Roosevelt helped start, uh, you know, set the course of action for conservation. But what we do here necessarily doesn't work in Africa. It's a whole different dynamic over there. I mean, some of the general principles do work. General principles, I think we could say that general yeah. principles do work. But you have to go and look at... Um, the Western states. You have to mm-hmm. go look at Africa. You got to go look at Europe. The mm-hmm. bugs in Europe. You yep. know, you, yeah. The, each plays a different dynamic, but there's a foundation of general sure. principles. Sure. You know, and, and it's just like, man, you got to start somewhere. And why not start with whatever the simple common denominator that you can provide mm-hmm. and go from there? Uh, I think you, as you go along, you also got to watch out, though. Because some people will do things with a hidden agenda. Sure. They will, I'll say, infiltrate you and yep. and things will get twisted and changed on you. Mm-hmm. And then it turns mm-hmm. out bad. And so it's like... Do a little history reading. I, 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 are you alluding to what we talked about in the break a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, all I'm going to say, I, I, I don't want to throw names no, or no, anything no, no. out there, but, just, but do a little history on the to... beginning of, of what happened uh, with, with when those five guys started conservate the efforts in conservation got yellowstone running and then look what happened in the west and do a little history right right. you got to do a little homework and and see how things started to portray which was good and then kind of follow the trail to what they have today right yep yep it's just interesting it is um and and he also said you got to have he said uh, uh drive and desire uh and not it adds and that, fuel to the tank. It, you you it, need that. It helps because it's a long haul. And not haul. just passion. Yeah, because it's a long haul. Right. We've all got passion for deer hunting. A passion for deer hunting doesn't get you into the woods. You got to have the desire and the drive to get you there. Right. You know, otherwise you're not going to be there. Absolutely. So, but I uh, tell you what, let's take another break here. We'll step outside. We'll come back. We'll get back into the uh, the lecture with Shane Mahoney. We'll be right back after this. So, what do you do when you've completely redefined the way bows are engineered? When you've reached the pinnacle and the band starts playing your victory song, you start a revolution out of thin air. Introducing the all-new PSE Carbon Air, engineered with true carbon technology to be the lightest high-performance bow in the world. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organics fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much-needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential. All right, back for the third segment of the show. We're going to join back in with Shane Mahoney at Michigan State University. So, people say we have faced challenges today. We're worried about endangered species acts, and we're worried about how to manage our forests, and we're worried about <coughs> whether animals are listed or delisted, and we're worried about you know uh, all kinds of issues. We're worried about CWD. We're worried about diseases in wildlife and transmission to people, and 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 all of that seems completely. Out of our hands, it seems like we cannot make enough of a difference to win. But what was it about those people who launched this movement in this country so long ago? What was it that convinced people in the 1870s, 1870s, to set aside the lands of Yellowstone? What possibly could have been moving through their DNA, through their bloodstream, to get them to imagine that that was the thing to do at that time. 
and all of these other far-sighted views that these individuals had. I ask you a question. Do you believe that we today are asking those far-sighted questions? Or are we asking questions about smaller, closer issues and forgetting about the long-term implications of the decisions we make today? Are we forgetting about what your country will look like and what Canada will look like 50 years from now, 75 years from now? Are we making decisions in this great system of conservation established in your country inside these, these, these universities, inside these places of knowledge and in our agencies and NGOs? Are we asking those kinds of questions that seemingly those individuals 150 years ago had to have been asking themselves or we wouldn't have the system we have? The answer is yes, we are. I want you to write me. I want you to write me and tell me that experience you've had. If the answer is no, then the question we have to ask ourselves is why not? Because if we don't, we will soon reach the world of 25 years and 50 years. And the question will be this great idea of conservation. Where will we have taken it? I think there are three problems facing conservation in this world. Every problem I have ever looked at in the conservation realm, I have come to the conclusion, falls into one <coughs> of these elements, spheres of influence. The first is that too few people care. Too few of us care. The second is that those of us who do care are divided. We bring out a particular perspective, we bring out a particular way of looking at conservation, and then we believe that that is the right way to look at conservation, and anybody else who has a different view is looking at it somehow in the wrong way. And the third problem we have in conservation is that we are running out of money to do the things that are necessary for the natural world. I think almost all of the other things fit there. And so the question is, if we have too few people who care about conservation, why is that the case? Why do too few people care? Why is it that in your last presidential election and the last federal election in Canada, that the issues of conservation were virtually nowhere to be seen? If we really believe that conservation is about the future of humanity, the future of the country, the future of your economies, the future of all of that, then how is it that in our political systems in Canada and the United States and elsewhere in the world, this great idea seems to be off the political table? Well, I think that's just another manifestation of the fact that too few people care, because I can assure you if more people care and we're outspoken about that feeling and that emotion and that commitment to conservation, you better believe it will be on the political table. So that leads to the obvious question, if I'm right, that too few people care. How do we make people care? How do we find a way to lead people, to inspire people, to have people care about the conservation of nature in the United States of America and in other nations around the world. Well, I come at this question in a lot of different ways. I come at this question and I ask myself, despite all of the efforts that we are making, despite all of the NGOs and all of the government programs and all of the things that we are exercising, we still feel that we need to do much more and we have evidence to indicate that we need to do much more. We are losing species. We are losing populations. In the last 50 years, we've lost 50% of the vertebrate biomass on this planet. 50% in 50 years. The World Wildlife Fund report released only six months ago. Let's say it's wrong by a wide margin, it's still pretty frightening. So we still have a long way to go. What is it going to take to get us there? And why haven't we gotten there already? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons, and I think they are germane and they pertain directly conservation leadership. First of all, 
Brunel and Roosevelt and Muir and Pinchot were successful because they worked at capturing the hearts and minds of people in an emotional way. Roosevelt said repeatedly that I accept that the people of the United States of America may utilize the resources of this nation. But I do not accept that any American should be free to use the resources of this nation in any way that impairs the enjoyment and equal sharing of those resources by the generations to come and the generations of Americans on board. He tied the idea of conservation not to just images of wild creatures that many people had not seen or to parts of the American West that only a handful of white Americans had ever witnessed. He tied the idea of conservation to the idea of citizenship the idea of nationalism, to be an American, to call yourself an American citizen. You had to be concerned for the conservation of these wild resources. So, what do you think? I, so, had to, I had to start the same way he started his segment. People say. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I, I made a few little notes as we were going along. Um, the thing st- stuck out to me. Are we asking the small questions of today, or are we concerned about the long-term questions? You know, um, uh, we think long-term for us, we always think 10 years, maybe 20 years down. Hey, I'm planning for retirement now, you know, 15 years down the road. In, in, our, in our sense of us, that would be long-term. Mm-hmm. Right. In sense of conversation, conservation, it would be longer than that. So are the that's a very good question are the questions being the right questions being answered Mm -hmm. you know um in today's society what's the biggest thing immediate satisfaction right Uh, take care uh, of it now take care of it now and a lot of that happens right Mm -hmm. something happens in the news something happens protest blah 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 immediate reaction well something that's been going on you and i have talked about this off the record and i'll bring it up now because i don't have an opinion one way or the other i mean i do but Anwar Providence, uh, the Anwar uh, section up in uh, Alaska. Oh, yeah. You know, there's talk of opening that back up for drilling. Right. Okay. Long-term, short-term impact. Short-term, we're going to get oil, energy, be able to power whatever, help yep. our, help the country out. Long-term, how is it going to impact uh, nature? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, not an, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm, I'm not, not a scientist, so right. I don't know. Um, I do know we need energy. I do know that if there's a safe way to do it, I, I feel we should be able to do and it. But I, I just don't have all that information yet. I think we need the energy. I think if it's regulated to the point where they have to be very careful with mm-hmm. what they do, mm-hmm. uh, I think it can work hand in hand. Yeah, you just you just can't say no, right? Because come we, up with a solution, a long term solution, a long, a short term, mid term, long term yeah. solution. Yeah, what, how's it going to impact? Us? Exactly. So, you know, and that that's that's one of the things. And like you said, you know, and the kids of today, uh, and even even a lot of adults, they need that instant satisfaction. Right. The, the, they don't want to plant the seed and watch it grow for three months. Mm-hmm. They want to plant the seed and skip to three months and boom. Yeah. Well, there you go. Logging projects that we're doing. There's short-term, mid-term, long-term goals, you know. Um, you know, there's always conflict about cutting. Well, you know, what's this going to do to my, my hunting property? Well, yeah, there's going to be an impact. Right. And the first time I walked up, and I remember our camp manager, as I walked up and looked at a spot that I, my old hunting area, and I just went, wow. You know, I mean, my eyes just, I was bug-eyed. And he's like, he cautiously said, well, what do you think? You know. Right, exactly. And I'm like, well, I see progress. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking long-term. Yeah, yeah, it's it's devastate if you want to call it that i don't see it as devastation i see it as progress my forester asked me that same question in that same almost that same tone what do you think <laughs> right because he said to me he goes dan especially with with people that aren't always around their uh absentee owners like right. i am kind of really right and uh he says those are the people that he gets the most comments of because they're not seeing it every day right they show up boom and boom i said it's shocking, yeah. Expected, mm-hmm. yeah. sure. But that's why I wanted you to send me pictures. Right. So I wouldn't be so shell-shocked. Right. I said, but it's progress. We got to start somewhere. Right. And right. 
It's already starting to grow back in spots. Yeah. So well, it's, I'm not... We've got sections that we logged this past winter, and we had to shut down because of the warm-up real quick. We're going to finish our logging this winter after rifle season. But there's sections that we... That, it was pretty much almost a clear cut. And right now, the BAM is over six, seven foot tall. Exactly. It grew back so quick, you know. And that's that's great vegetation for deer, you know. Deer, grouse, you, bear. Yeah. You, you know, animals and critters hide in it and feed off of it and... It, yeah, it, it's you got to look at that long term, um, the long term versus the short term. That, I thought that was insightful. But he said the three problems with conservation today: too few people care, those who do care are divided, and we're running out of money. And and how do we make the people care? I, we talk about the, he talks a little bit about that here at the end in the next segment. But how how do we get to that point? You know, there are too few people who care. Like you said, immediacy, kids. Right, and look at what he said. He said about the political aspect, mm-hmm. right? You don't see it on any political agenda, so nobody cares. Absolutely not. Until something goes variably wrong. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden it becomes the biggest thing since sliced bread. Oh, yeah. my Lord, here we yeah. go. Uh, but it's always in the in the backs of minds of, of people in the outdoors. But on the big stage, it's not really mm-hmm. bubbled up. Right. Uh, right now the biggest thing is, is your guns. Right. But, you know, it, that ain't going anywhere. But it's just the people need to care. If and the people need to care today for the people of tomorrow. Right. Yeah. It, you know, one thing we were at uh, our co-op meeting um, back Labor Day, and we had MUCC's uh, Anna Mitterling on there to give a presentation. I mean, she was talking about CWD, and the, the, it's going to be. Maybe it wasn't there. Maybe it's someplace else that I heard her say this, but it, it's it's not going to be a, a, a problem that we deal with for a couple of years to fix. It's going to be decades plural that it's going to take it's it's a long term yes effort just like everything else comes to long term you got to look at it long term not short term and, and, and get over that that hump of trying to figure out how how do we attack something and i think we, we do we just we we look at things politically we look at things in in small numbers of years versus decades right so simple um you know and the other thing i, I thought about talking about you know how do we get people to care how do we how do we start moving this forward? And, and I brought up a point at that meeting. I said, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the NRC, Michigan's NRC, National Resource Commission, not really listening to the DNR or to the people of the state. And I said, well, those people are appointed by the governor. What if outdoors men and women of, of this state got together as a coalition and formed a, an official coalition, a hunter movement? to elect a governor of this state that would work for conservation. And are they making choices based on their background, who backs them? And are those decisions made for the short-term, long-term? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and and you should have seen the eyes that were raised. It was just like, wow. Right, exactly. Never thought about it. Yeah. Well, why not? Why Why haven't we and thought about that? I mean, I, this is our, our livelihood. You I'll, know, I'll throw future. a shout-out to Lincoln Roan. That's a guy who was passionate about something. Got something moving, mm-hmm. and now on Facebook has over twenty something thousand members. Yeah, and in being a voice, the, potentially it's powerful to do that. It is. It is. That shows you it can be done. Yeah, there's passion, there's fire, there's drive. Yep. So, all right, I tell you what, let's step outside, take our last break, come back. We'll we'll uh, listen to the last part of what uh, Shane Mahoney had to say at Michigan State University, and then we'll discuss that when we come back. Be right back after this. I shoot PSE because I like one pin to 40 yards. I shoot PSE for the perfect combination of feel and performance. I shoot PSE because you can shoot lighter poundage and increase arrow speed. I shoot PSE for the fastest bows on the planet. I shoot PSE because my livelihood depends on my bow. I shoot PSE because better engineering makes a better bow. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organic fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential.
Welcome back, and now we're going to join Shane Mahoney for the last segment of his speech at Michigan State University on Conservation. Secondly, that team, that small, relatively small team of well-known people we know, were absolutely relentless. They simply would not stop. If it took 15 years to get a piece of legislation through on fur seals, that's what Grinnell did. If it took 20 years to stop the sale of wildlife, dead wildlife in this country, that's what it took and that's what they did. If it took repeated efforts and failures and repeated efforts and failures to accomplish these goals, that is what they did. It didn't matter that they were rich blue bloods from the American East. It didn't matter that they were politically connected. It didn't matter that they had the pens of journalism and they also had the offices of high power. They relentlessly pursued these ideas. And the third thing they did, of many, the third thing they did was they did not differentiate between classes of wildlife or classes of people who cared about classes of wildlife. So yes, Roosevelt was a hunter. He loved to hunt. He was also an extremely keen birder. He was an individual who loved birds, loved them. There are all kinds of stories of him breaking out of his office, the Oval Office, and running out to hear the first warbler that had come back in spring. He had study skins as a child in the drawers of his bureau where he kept study skins of birds and small nests filled with little mice. We made him out to be this individual who spent his life, you know, doing good things, but mostly harvesting in the rugged outdoor life of the hunter and the hunter frontiers. The truth of the matter is, he cared deeply about all of nature. And he didn't feel that he needed to compartmentalize his feelings for nature into big game versus, oh, I care about birds or I care about wilderness disorder. He didn't shun John Muir, when John Muir, who had the greatest wilderness prophet this country has ever produced and who has left so much to us, did Roosevelt say, oh my, well, we won't invite them to dinner? No, he and John Muir were friends. When John Muir formed the Sierra Club, he came to the Boone and Crockett Club, he came to Teddy Roosevelt, he said, I need your help about these issues in California. And Roosevelt and Grinnell and others said, John, we are so busy trying to protect Yellowstone and get that thing up and running properly and getting it to work properly, we cannot help you with that problem right now. So why don't you go form your own organization? And so he went and formed the Sierra Club. We have managed over time to somehow concoct the fantasy that these entities born out of the one communion of idealism were somehow created out of two disparate views of the world. A lie, at worst, a falsehood and myth at best. Those men, those men who formed the cornerstones of the conservation movement that all of us owe our positions and jobs and interests to, they did not partition. They did not partition. And the reason they did not partition was because in leadership it is not about power and authority and status and how many members you have. Leadership in conservation is about never forgetting that there's one, one, one objective. And that one objective is to keep the wild others with us in the greatest possible abundance, in the greatest number of places possible on the planet. Now I ask you, I ask every one of you, and you may be parts of many organizations, good organizations, doing good work, but I ask you, are they focused on the universal issue that I have just described? Or are they focused on a sectoral part of that issue? And are they, from their dialogue and from their meetings, do you get the impression that they're always thinking about wildlife? Or do you get the impression that they're often thinking more about their organization, its structure, the number of members it has, how much money it can compile? I'm a member of many of them. I respect them. I work with them but I know what it is going to take to get us moving forward for the next 25 and 50 years in conservation in this part of the world, let alone what it's going to take to solve the problems in Africa and parts of Asia. 
it will only be done and only accomplished by leadership that moves from the center and that brings people together, that builds coalitions and never forgets what the objective truly is. We can throw around all the terms we want. Sustainable use, preservationism, protectionism. They're all meaningless to me. They're just bits of ingredient that go into the stew. They're not the meal itself. We need it all. We didn't just need it all a hundred years ago. We need it all today. We need every one of those efforts working and working together to make the differences that we need to make. A great many times in these circumstances, I will hear people say that you know a particular group or a particular view of conservation said, um, you know, we are wrong because of this, but we believe they are wrong because of it. And we model up these debates to the extent that, as far as I'm concerned, we place ourselves in a circumstance where we cannot possibly get out of it. We cannot possibly solve these questions. I'll give you an example, because it's an important one. There's a great debate in the world of conservation about the whole idea of sustainable use versus the idea of protectionist approaches to wildlife. I call my organization Conservation Visions in the Plural because I am willing to embrace any idea that gives me hope for wildlife. And that is, that is a man or a woman who wishes to hunt the fish. That's a man or woman who is poured by it. But they have ideas that they can contribute to the conservation of nature I would add. But so often I hear these debates get ground down away from the leadership position to what I call an anti-leadership position. For example, many in the consumptive use world, the hunting world, will claim that it is people in the anti-hunting world who are responsible for the turmoil and the discussions that currently occur over the use of wildlife, and also not only wildlife, but other animals that somehow a particular organization that's formed that believes in animal rights or animal protectionism are able to manipulate the minds of all of the people in the United States of America or somewhere else in the world and convince them of a particular viewpoint. And of course, this occurs vice versa. The truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, what's integral to the leadership for conservation to understand is that what is happening in society is that society is moving on a wide front influenced by a myriad of influences and is not at all controlled by one or two narrow viewpoints on any issue. We are a changing society. Rural America is not what it was 50 years ago. Family structures are not what they were 50 years ago. The aspirations of young people are not the same as they were 50 years ago. The cultural makeup of this nation is not the same as it was 50 years ago. And I could go on and on and on and on. And all of those pieces are changing. The attitudes, the prevalent attitudes, the prevailing attitudes that are expressed by the American nation. We need to understand in this business of conservation that if we want to move that changing society in the directions that we believe are best for conservation and human life that we had better stop breaking that complicated argument down into petty warfare between organizations. Petty warfare between ideologies. We will do what Roosevelt, Grinnell, and others so long ago do, did. We will do what John Muir did. We will do what Paulo Leopold did. We will do what Rachel Carson did which is to keep our eyes and our minds on wildlife and what is best for them, the wild others who made us human. Without them, we wouldn't even have the bloody term because we wouldn't know what to compare ourselves to. They made us human. And they are the target now 
fortunately or unfortunately for them, and we will determine the difference there, they are now dependent upon us to keep them on this planet. What is at stake is not the winning of an ideological war over the partitioned belief systems and the conservation movement. I do not care what organization is involved. I do not care who leads it. I do not care what its pedigree is. I do not care how young or how old it is. That is not what matters. What matters is we need to explain to the American people and the Canadian people and the people of this world everywhere that what we are fighting for is the maintenance of creation. What we are fighting for is that there will always be the possibility, even if they never see it, of elk in alpine meadows in the morning sun, that there will be the chance of seeing grizzly bears moving on flats and through brilliantly colored shrubbery in the fall of Alaska, that we will be able to witness the huge ungulates that move across this continent, the great moose and the caribou and so on that have enthralled and kept our lives conjoined with nature for so long and maintained so many of the cultures of mankind. It will be that there will be places left left in purity, untamed, unbroken, unsullied for future generations. People can understand these ideas, but someone has to bring them to them. The American people at the turn of the 20th century were not clamoring for the conservation idea. It was brought to them, brought to them by people who carried it in their hearts and carried it in their minds and refused to accept that the prevailing pressures against conservation would not succeed. You have, in this country, the greatest possible inspiration and the greatest possible reason to believe that we can do it again. We can do it even better. And we can plan for the conservation of nature in the United States of America and the rest of the world better than we currently are. To be defeated in this state of world, to be defeated in this, is to lose ourselves. Because without them, not just the boy from Newfoundland, but without them, your lives will be empty of something irreplaceable. You may not think of the small bird that chirps in the morning on the way to school, on the way to class. You may not think so much of the deer you saw in the field that evening. You may not be preoccupied by these things, but I guarantee you, if we ever lose them, you will remark how silent and alone this world is. Leadership will take us in the direction away from it. Thank you very much. All right. So you've heard the entire thing. You've had time to kind of reflect on it as we go along. Last segment and overall, what do you? what's your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'd like to really point out the fact that when he spoke people listened it's kind of like ef hutton yep. you, you didn't hear i mean we really cranked that audio to get, right. get he, it to play you didn't you, you didn't hear coughing hacking no not really it was Nothing. very in like you said you, you enhanced the audio so you could and the, the people could hear it better but it was quiet and they were listening yeah and so it was very well very well done and left you with thoughts mm-hmm you know, well, my, this, my biggest thought is, what am I going to do? This is my thinking. I've told you it now. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, uh, you going to think long term. You're going to think short term. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. now you go out and you take care of business. Yep. Because, and he's right, without doing anything, the silence, you'll be alone. And we've talked about this. And what's the first person or somebody, when either they're out hunting or they're outside, and they'll tell you, well, I heard the birds singing this morning. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't hear anything this morning. Right. You remember the, a while back, this was back, oh, I think 2008 or nine, maybe 10. I was at deer camp doing a coyote hunt. Um, we had uh, wolf tracks on the property that morning. And it was the first time um, I'd ever had that encounter. Right. And I found that out after the morning hunt on the way back in. But the thing that struck me was I didn't hear a single bird chirp. I didn't see a bird. I didn't hear a chipmunk or see a chipmunk or a squirrel. I didn't even see a deer. I saw absolutely zero animals and heard zero animal noises, and the silence was deafening. Yeah, and, and think about that. If we yeah. don't do nothing, imagine that being the norm. The norm, yeah. Going outside and nothing. 
it'd be you know no no dogs running around no no cats in your house it would be know. an injustice for us not to try to do anything you know just your domestic animals um let alone your wild your wild critters right exactly so um, very good very well done and uh awesome there's more to this um that we don't have time for there was question and answer and actually only one question got asked because of the time it took them about 15 20 minutes to answer it wasn't a simple question <laughs> obviously well it, it basically the question is a, a lady asked well you, you say you know not everybody's the leader you know there's only so many leaders but you can be an individual leader how how do we take this message to the masses and make an impact and he answered that he answered it quite well and i tell you maybe we'll play that next week yeah we'll play it next week and you know and expand upon this whole idea exactly of it's conservation just, you know, this show has been a little different than our typical you and I going at it and talking about things. Yeah. But it's also, it's people, we got to look to the future. Absolutely. And not just tomorrow. But <laughs> look look ahead. Look ahead at not just your kids, but look ahead at, at, at your grandkids, your great-grandkids and their kids. You know, look look at what you can do that's going to impact 50 to 100 years down the road. You know, looking back at what, what those guys, those five guys did in, in the 1870s and 80s, without that... We wouldn't be sitting here talking about this today. No, we wouldn't. Who knows what we'd be doing? And, and one thing that he did say, uh, and you got to point out, is they were told no. Several they, times. But they kept on going. And mm-hmm. if it took five years, 10 years, 15 years to get legislation or whatever they were trying to push through, they kept at they it. They kept at it. Yeah. They just didn't go at it and go, oh, we're yeah. done. Who do we see doing that right now for us here in Michigan? You know, you got Lincoln it. Roan. <laughs> Lincoln Roan. You know, they, they went at it. They went at it hard last year, and they were told no. But did that stop him? No. No. No, he's back at it. He's back up on the horse, and he's riding into next year and trying to think of different ways to go, but keeping at it. Yeah. Not saying no, not closing up the Facebook page and saying, well, we're done. It was good. Have fun. No, we're going to keep at it. We're going to try to add more members, try to get the word Mm -hmm. out here in Michigan, try to get into the ears of the right people Mm -hmm. that need to be heard, um, and something will happen. Mm Mm-hmm. You just got to keep going. Yeah, you got you got the passion, the drive, the desire. Use that to move forward and make a positive change. And uh, tell as many people as you can. You know, share the word. You know, don't browbeat them with it. Don't tell them what they have to do. Um, and like I said, next week uh, we'll have yeah, we'll go his over. rebuttal on, on or his answer to that question on the show. And that's another important point that to the people out there, when you talk with other people, they have opinions. Absolutely. And because they have an opinion doesn't make them right, wrong, or indifferent. Right. They have an opinion. Yeah. Just like you have an, have an opinion. opinion. Look in the mirror, yep. right? Yeah. You both have opinions. Agree to disagree. That, yep. That's the simplest form to do it. And tell them in a way, don't have to be belligerent. You don't mm-hmm. have to be whatever. You tell them in a way that just says, hey, this is the way I believe. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Think about it. Yep. Yep. And tell me how you believe and why you and why you believe that way. And right. let, let's see where the facts lie and let's see if we can make this work together. A gentleman's debate. Exactly. How many times do we sit and scream and yell and and browbeat each other? That's that's the problem when emo- and that, emotion gets in the middle of and, it. And and that and that happens in organizations all the time. Sure it does. Sure it does. And, and that leads to worst enemy. And that leads to bad things. Mm-hmm. And being narrow narrow focused and not listening to other people yeah. or not as he said, the world is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. So as an as a group, whatever that group might be, if you don't change. Mm-hmm. You're gonna stay that group, get smaller, and eventually you're just gonna go poof into nothing because everybody's gonna die out. And if you, exactly, uh, we we've all been part of or are part of groups, groups that like are that. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Whether they're outdoor groups or whether they're just groups in general, right? So you you need to. Uh, you can even take it as simple as a knitting group. Yeah. If, if you yeah. don't teach people to knit, the knitters that become older knitters just die off, and exactly nobody knows how to do it. Right. And we see that today. We see yep. that so much of that today in different avenues. So, all right. Well, I'll tell you what. It's uh, Saturday afternoon. And uh, for those of you who listen to the podcast, we are going to do a live stream. Um, so go back and listen to that as well on our Facebook page. Danny will repost that on uh, Wednesday. on Wednesday on Vimeo and YouTube. Uh, we're just going to have a general discussion here and kind of open it up to anybody who might be online. So check that out as well. But uh, we'll be back next week. Next week? I'll be coming back from Deer Camp. And I'm I'm excited for your stories. We'll see. We'll see. I'm cautiously optimistic. It's going to be a good week. It's going to be cold. <laughs> it's going to be cold. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. going to keep my fingers crossed and hope my arrow flies true. That's right. So, all right. That'll do it for us this week, folks. Until next time on the Up North Journal. This episode was brought to you by PSE Archery. Black Eagle Arrows. 
fourth arrow camera arms, wind scent vapor hunting scents, killer food plot seeds, attractants, and supplements, Cabela's, spot shooters, antler action, family traditions tree stands, and badass slingshots. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.